Kiev lit up by explosions on the ground. Attacks condemned angrily by the Russian government, accusing the West of being complicit. Ukrainian drone attacks on peaceful and civilian targets once again confirm the terrorist nature of the Kyiv regime. It is also clear that Ukrainian drones simply would not be able to fly such a distance without carefully researched information from Western satellites. Ukraine came under heavy attack itself from Russian drones and missiles overnight. But its attacks on Russia are more significant because they show it's enhancing its drone capability. In recent months, targeting the electricity supply in Bielgorod, oil facilities in Krasnodar and infrastructure in Crimea, including the Kerch Bridge. Then increasing its range to hit Russia's capital, Moscow. But this was the biggest drone operation yet, striking six cities across western and southern Russia. The furthest was Peskov, hundreds of miles north of Ukraine. Transporter planes photographed there two weeks ago are vital for Russia's war effort to ferry troops and arms to the front line. This is what's now left of some of them. And the attack comes as Ukraine's counteroffensive is putting Russian defences under more and more pressure. Just when you're hitting them hard down on, on the main actual battle line, you then hit someone behind the lines, and that creates some pretty significant strategic effect, I think. It's putting a Pretty clear message to the Russians that you can run, but you can't hide. We can strike you pretty much anywhere. Vladimir Putin told his people his invasion was vital to keep them safe. Ukrainians are using drones to prove the opposite is true, with increasing drone and missile attacks against Russian territory since the start of the war. What does this mean for the conflict? Overnight last night, the Russians mounted a sustained attack against Kyiv with around 20 drones in what was described as a massive attack with two people dying. But despite that, the big news was Ukrainian attacks on Moscow and on Russian territory. There were six regions of Russia that were attacked last night in the biggest wave of attacks by Ukraine ever since the war started 18 months ago. Now, most of these targets were around the south-southwest of Russia, relatively close to Ukraine border. But of note, Ukrainians also seem to target Puskov, which is a Russian military airfield only about 20 miles away from the Latvian border. Apparently, 10 to 20 drones attacked that airfield overnight. In addition to that, though, the Russians claim they shot down a number of Ukraine drones targeting Crimea, and also there were more drones targeting Moscow, and that ended up with the Moscow airspace being closed down for a significant period last night. Why were these attacks significant? Were they as a result of Ukrainian frustration that the front line hasn't moved much over the last 10 weeks? Or is the timing of these attacks linked to the next phase of the conflict? It's worth looking at Puskov, the airfield at Puskov, in more detail, where the Russians base their IL-76. These are big Russian transport aircraft that are used to ferry supplies around the front line. By targeting those, it's stopping Russia moving some of its key equipment around. Now, they shouldn't be vulnerable. But the reality was these aircraft were not protected, they were not in hardened aircraft shelters, and although Russia claimed that only two had been damaged initially, uh, subsequent reports suggested that at least two were blazing away and were certainly uh, destroyed, and two more looked to be significantly damaged. The timing of this is also interesting because the front line has been relatively static for the last 10 weeks, despite huge efforts for Ukraine to make a breakthrough. But Ukraine has been gradually working its way through the layered defence of Russia, particularly around, around Robotyne, which is just to the east of Zaporizhia. And it looks likely that they might be on the verge of some major breakthrough. Now, conventional wisdom would suggest that Russia would therefore reinforce the area to plug that gap before Ukrainians could break through. But if Ukraine could sow a, a, a few seeds of doubt in the Russian minds by targeting Crimea, targeting the east of Zaporizhia, targeting to the north of Donbass, and also Moscow, it would cause Russia to try to establish where they're going to put their reserves and almost certainly not move them at all. And the attacks on the transport fleet back up that uh, hypothesis that this is almost certainly we're on seeing the cusp of a potentially significant breakthrough by Ukraine. 
when looking at why Ukraine are using drones, one has to remember that Ukraine is the David to the Russian Goliath. They're a much smaller nation and they have to use asymmetric tactics in order to prevail in this war. Now drones can be either long range or short range. They're relatively cheap, they're relatively easy to procure. The downside is they're quite vulnerable. They are not equipped with a great deal of self-protection and they're relatively easy to shoot down. But some do get through. Quantity has a quality all of its own. The key factor about drones is they are able to be innovated overnight. The Russians do not innovate, but the Ukrainians have proved very, very effective at seeing where there are any shortfalls in these drones' capability, rewiring them, reprogramming them overnight so they're ready to go into combat the next day. And that's proving remarkably effective and agile, which is critical to battlefield success. And what the three main uh, areas where these drones are proving effective one of which is addressing Russian complacency. Russians have left their big strategic aircraft out in the open on an airfield, which makes them very vulnerable to drones. The Ukrainian attacks against Moscow are not achieving a great deal of success tactically on the ground, but strategically the psychological effect of these regular attacks means that Putin can't claim that he's protecting Russians. And finally, on the front line, these little drones, these nano drones, are proving very effective at being the eyes and the ears over the battlefield. The one thing that uh, drone warfare has absolutely been synonymous with this battle, it's been a game changer and will have profound implications for the way defence and the militaries are configured around the world after this conflict is over. This contributed to the scenario we are witnessing here in Florida. It's certainly the case that Hurricane Adalia travelled fast largely as a result of the conditions that fueled its power, high sea temperatures and all. It is a blessing that in the path of the hurricane largely were rural areas. Had urban areas, highly populated areas been hit, then the casualty count could have been far greater. It has been bad. Two men have died in car accidents that are described as weather related. Hurricane Adalia has moved on. It has crossed the state line. It arrived in Florida as Category 3. It's moved on to the state of Georgia as Category 1. It's disappeared from here, but it remains a danger. James, live there in Florida. Thank you. The UK's rollout of flu and coronavirus vaccines has been brought forward after the emergence of a new COVID variant. NHS officials have indicated that the latest COVID variant is the most concerning since the arrival of Omicron. Vaccination efforts aimed at care home residents and those who are immunocompromised will now start on the 11th of September rather than in October. A two-year-old girl has died after being struck by a car at a holiday park in Cambridgeshire. Isabella Tucker was taken to Kings Lynn Hospital after the incident last Friday, but she died of her injuries. A 42-year-old woman has been arrested on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving. The Chief Constable of Nottinghamshire Police has paid her respects to Police Officer Graham Saville, who died after he was hit by a train while trying to save a man's life on a railway line in Newark. His death was described as an enormous shock. Sergeant Graham Saville was a hugely respected and popular colleague, and his death in the line of duty has come as an enormous shock to us all. When a colleague dies in the line of duty, the sadness is felt by the entire policing family, and we will all sadly mourn our colleague Graham together. Ukrainian drones are again being downed over Russia tonight after what's thought to be its biggest coordinated assault on Kremlin territory since the start of the war. There are also reports that six Ukrainian servicemen have been killed in an accident involving two helicopters. We'll bring you more on that story as it develops. Here's Sky's international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, on Kyiv's strategic and symbolic victory. For more and more Russians, the war is coming closer to home. In six cities, Ukrainian drones wreaked havoc. The most spectacular attack in Peskov. Huge walls of smoke lit up by explosions on the ground. Attacks condemned angrily by the Russian government accusing the West of being complicit. Ukrainian drone attacks on peaceful and civilian targets once again confirm the terrorist nature of the Kyiv regime. It is also clear that Ukrainian drones simply would not be able to fly such a distance without carefully researched information from Western satellites. 
Ukraine came under heavy attack itself from Russian drones and missiles overnight. But its attacks on Russia are more significant because they show it's enhancing its drone capability. In recent months, targeting the electricity supply in Bielgorod, oil facilities in Krasnodar and infrastructure in Crimea, including the Kerch Bridge. Then increasing its range to hit Russia's capital, Moscow. But this was the biggest drone operation yet, striking six cities across western and southern Russia. The furthest was Peskov, hundreds of miles north of Ukraine. Transporter planes photographed there two weeks ago are vital for Russia's war effort to ferry troops and arms to the front line. This is what's now left of some of them. And the attack comes as Ukraine's counteroffensive is putting Russian defences under more and more pressure. Just when you're hitting them hard down on, on the main actual battle line, you then hit someone behind the lines, and that creates some pretty significant strategic effect, I think. It's putting a pretty clear message to the Russians that you can run, but you can't hide. We can strike you pretty much anywhere. Vladimir Putin told his people his invasion was vital to keep them safe. Ukrainians are using drones to prove the opposite is true, with increasingly devastating effect. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. Now they travelled through three capital cities, four airports and two continents. Paul Rhodes and his family made the epic journey just to return to the UK from Romania after their flights were cancelled. Today there are calls for the National Air Traffic Service and not the airlines to foot the £100 million estimated bill needed to compensate thousands of passengers. Rachel Venables has more. So this is our epic journey home. This wasn't how Paul planned to get home. At some kind of uh, truck stop in the middle of uh, uh, northeastern Romania. But when Monday's Nats outage cancelled his family's flight from Bucharest to London, they were determined to get back by any means necessary, beginning with a nine hour bus journey to Moldova. First leg of the journey done, we set off at about 9 30 this morning, and now it's quarter to midnight here in Moldova. and. We're all pretty knackered. Then booking a flight to Istanbul on Wednesday night before finally flying to Stansted on Thursday morning. So my son put it this morning, we're going to be uh, three capital cities, four airports and uh, two continents um, to get home to London from Bucharest. Getting them home 48 hours late and at a cost of about £1,400. It's thought this whole saga could end up costing airlines close to a hundred million pounds. So it's very clear that the cause of this problem was completely outside of the control of airlines, and yet they will be responsible for carrying the bill. So we believe that this is a great example of why this legislation needs to be reviewed and where compensation is paid by the people who caused the problem. And in this case, the problem very clearly caused by NATS. Plane schedules are slowly returning to normal, but there have been fresh cancellations affecting yet more passengers. On Wednesday, at least 42 flights to and from Heathrow were axed as questions mount about how such a catastrophic failure could have been caused by a bit of dodgy data. Nats insists the glitch has been fixed and won't be repeated, but many in the industry are nervous as stranded travellers fight to get home. Rachel Venables, Sky News, Heathrow. It's the handshake in Beijing causing a rift in the Conservative government in Westminster. Foreign Secretary James Cleverley today insisted diplomacy would deliver as he visited China and raised concerns on human rights abuses and crackdowns on democracy. But many in his party are demanding that ministers take a tougher stance, with one former leader even comparing the UK's current approach to appeasement. Sky's Asia correspondent Helen Ann Smith has this report from Beijing. This place is the very centre of Chinese power and political theatre. The Great Hall of the People, heavily securitised, closely watched. And it's been a five-year wait since a British foreign secretary was welcomed here. But that changed today. Greetings with the Vice President Hang Zhong cordial enough and a clear desire from both to up their engagement. Talks are now underway and there is a lot at stake. It feels like the Foreign Secretary is coming here to seek something of a reset in the UK-China relationship. 
after a period that's been largely characterised by growing distrust and disagreement. Disagreements that may have been more keenly felt in the day's second meeting. Wang Yi, known for his tough talk and diplomacy, just listened to his subtle critique of more sceptical...